Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ideas for Tomorrow. Hello, and thank you for joining us. Judy Faulkner is the founder and CEO of Epic, one of the most successful healthcare information technology companies in the world. By digitalizing medical records, Epic puts vital information at caregivers' and patients' fingertips, providing the tools that millions of people use to improve care. Judy was born in New Jersey. Her father was a pharmacist, and her mother was the Oregon Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility. She earned college degrees in math and computer science. Judy started Epic in 1979. For much of its existence, Epic was an underdog in the digital health world. Today, Epic has more than 10,000 employees. The company's clients include Cleveland Clinic and many other major hospital systems. Epic products have become an important part of our caregivers' and patients' lives. Recently, we collaborated with Epic to customize the MyChart app to allow interactive home monitoring of COVID-19 patients. Judy has created a unique corporate culture at Epic that supports its employees' innovation and creativity. The company is privately held and employee-owned. One third of its operating expenses are devoted to research and development. It does little marketing. Judy is married to a pediatrician and has three grown children. She has created a philanthropic foundation to donate over 99% of her shares in Epic and created a trust to keep Epic private into the future. Here's a video to tell you more. 250 million people around the world use it. Over 500 healthcare organizations are a part of it. And every day, over 6 million records are exchanged through it. Epic is one of the most well-known names in the world of health information technology. Always at the helm, founder and CEO Judy Faulkner has built the company into the leading medical record software provider in the nation. It all started in a Wisconsin basement in 1979 when Judy Faulkner wrote the code that was the basis for Epic with the patient at the center. At that time, medical records were mainly paper, compiled in bulky charts, filled with handwritten notes and physician orders. Often, there was only one copy. Over the past four decades, Epic has been a leader in the industry, developing innovative software to help patients, clinicians, and hospital systems connect and communicate more effectively. From initial shareholder investments of $70,000, Judy has grown Epic to a multi-billion dollar organization. Located on a sprawling rural campus designed by architects who've worked with Disney and Microsoft, this employee-owned company develops all of its software in-house. In an effort to get the technology right, Epic teams are sent on immersion trips to hospitals and clinics where they witness the real-life impact of their developments. As a result, from telehealth visits to MyChart access and remote monitoring, Epic is helping transform healthcare for millions. Like the epics of literature, Epic chronicles a patient's healthcare journey, enhancing care delivery, reducing errors, and providing a seamless experience. The visionary behind it all, Judy Faulkner, has, in her own words, put the patient at the center and all the data around the patient, creating initiatives and applications that redefine the medical record for us all. Welcome, Judy, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. Well, uh, Judy, uh, let's let's begin with uh, the beginning of your journey. What what made you interested in computer science? Can you talk a bit about the early days of starting Epic? I was just watching it, this uh, documentary, and this reminded me of the old days of paper records. So I would like to hear a little bit from you by the beginning of your journey. Well, first I was uh, someone who really liked math. Ever since I had been in seventh grade and I had a teacher who put on the board, why do the digits of a number divisible by three add up to a number divisible by three? It was so interesting. 
And so I became a math major. And then uh, in my junior summer year, before I went as a senior to college, I went to the University of Rochester. And uh, I was supposed to go there for working in particle physics for the summer, of which I knew nothing about. And they wanted me to program. Well, I had never seen a computer. So they gave me a Fortran book and a week. And at the end of the week, it was Fortran, yeah. They said uh, I was a good programmer. At the end of the summer, we published two papers. And then when I applied to college, I applied in math for grad. I mean, for graduate school, I applied in math. And uh, two of the schools, one of them, University of Wisconsin, moved me by themselves to computer science. I thought that was neat. I didn't know you could do a degree in graduate school in computer science. So that's how I got into computer science. Then um, when I took computer science at UW, I took Warner Slack's probably first course in the world in computers and medicine. And at some point he asked me to work with him and his team. I said, okay. And then they brought me in after a few years and asked me to create a system that would keep track of patient clinical data over time, inpatient or outpatient. And they wanted to be able to define their own data elements and design their own screens. So what they were asking for was a clinical system when there weren't really clinical systems popularly being sold. There were lab systems and billing, but not clinical. And they wanted what we would call a database management system, but this was before Oracle and Sybase and DBase. So uh, what did I know? I didn't know it was hard. So I went away, built it, came back, uh, installed it in many different departments at the university. And then my customers at the university would go around the country and show people what they were doing. And then they'd call me up and say, start a company. And I would say no. And for about two years, I kept saying no, and I finally gave up and said yes. And then I had to figure out how in the world do you do it? So I started the company with one and a half people in a basement. I had a morning assistant, an afternoon assistant, and I was paid half time. Um, and that's how we started. And now, now the uh, company with one and a half employees grew up to be largest dominant uh, company in, in the field that you, that you pioneered. And Epic continues to be privately held. It, is, uh, it has a very unique structure. It is employee owned and uh, it continues to be based in the Midwest. How do those attributes uh, shape a very unique culture at Epic? Well, the Midwest is a great place to be. It's friendly, it's down to earth. There's a strong work ethic. You've got cold winters and warm summers. And um, I think one thing that's really nice is our campus is on over a thousand acres. So there's a lot of rural area around here so we can build buildings as we need them. Uh, being privately owned is great because we don't have to worry about the tyranny of the quarter. Um, our um, pressure, there's not a pressure to grow bigger every year and um, I, another CEO once said to me, who was running a public company, he said, Judy, you should go public. And I said, no, because then I'd have to spend half my time with Wall Street. And he said, no, it's all your time. So I'm glad that <laughs> we're private. <laughs> so so another, another really important uh, uh, aspect of Epic is it continues to evolve. Uh, for those of us who've been using Epic, who've been, so to say, growing up with, with the products that you and your team have been developing, we have been witnessing this, this evolution uh, with the changing technology. How are you looking now at uh, the newest technology, such as artificial intelligence? And what does uh, artificial intelligence in general machine learning can offer to, to Epic and ultimately to your customers? Sure, well, we're always watching what's new and working with a lot of the different companies out there who are creating the next new thing. Uh, and we're experimenting with it here. Some of the real interesting things to our uh, ambient voice, abil ability for the doctor to talk to the patient and the computer to be watching or actually listening to that 
and figuring out what's going on. Uh, artificial intelligence has been around for many, many years, since the beginning, practically, when we would be able to do things like drug-drug uh, interactions and alert the physician if there was a drug interaction that was coming up. But where it has changed now is it's gone from rules-based artificial intelligence to machine-based artificial intelligence. And now it's statistical methods that are used to produce those algorithms. And so there's lots of things. There's fall risk, there's deterioration, there's sepsis, there's COVID identification, there's um, a no-show uh, risk, all those various things. And uh, I'm really a, a pretty much a, a very strong and passionate proponent of sepsis because it kills so many people. And if you put in sepsis AI, even if it's not ours, six hours ahead of time before the human being can tell that this patient is uh, coming up with sepsis, six hours ahead of time, it can identify that in many cases and save lives. So that's really, really important to do. And we together, as we develop new technologies, we also begin to face new challenges in healthcare. And one of the most recent challenge and real challenge is the provider burnout. Yes. As I was watching, watching to this documentary, I vividly remember the days when we had uh, basements filled with, uh, with medical records when this resident needed to spend early morning hours uh, looking for x-rays and the images that we needed to find and bring it up to the, uh, to the operating room. And now with the electronic medical records, all of those things have gotten much, much better. Yet there are new challenges. And the challenges is how to use the electronic medical records effectively, uh, how to make sure that it doesn't, that it really aids the process of care delivery. And when we speak about burnout, the electronic medical record has oftentimes been mentioned in the same sentence. So how is Epic helping to address this particular issues, the uh, provider burnout? That's a really challenging topic, and we see a great variation. There are some people who at one end do absolutely excellent, and then some people even with the same systems could not do nearly as well. Huge variation. What we have found is that uh, our customers overseas, their notes are about one quarter the size of the notes in the US. So the notes in the US are four times what the notes overseas are. And a lot of it is the administrative overhead of what we have to collect in the United States compared to what needs to be collected in other countries. We're trying to help reduce that with closer relationships with the payers so that the information that the payers need can be automatically taken and brought to them and with less burden on the physician. Now, there are several things that are really important for avoiding physician burnout. And one thing, and this is uh, studied by class quite a bit. Number one, for our software at least, is that they need to use the settings are, that are there. So you have a phone, you have a smartphone, you set it to the things that are important to you, your favorites, your music, various things that you do to make it your phone. The same thing with the software. You need to look at it and figure out what can you set in the software to match how you work? And also the opposite. What can you look at that the software does that you can't change and how can you change how you'd work to manage that? There was a couple who uh, at one of our customer sites was walking past me down the hall and they stopped and the woman said, thank you for giving me back my husband. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. He had spent time just figuring out what he can change in the software or change himself, and it made all the difference in the world. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is training. And you've got to keep training uh, consistently and continuously with whatever you can to learn what the software can and can't do. There's an awful lot that it can do that maybe you don't know about. Uh, at the elbow training, thrive training, ongoing training, that's really important. And um, the workflow is critical, of course. So 
that matches a lot to physician builders. Do you have physician builders in the different specialties who know their specialty well and who can adjust the software, the workflow in the software to match how their specialty works in their environment? So I'd say those are the three big things that make the most difference in uh, physician burnout. Now, obviously there's another one too, which is things that just should be better and different. And we get a lot of feedback on that. We try to have focus groups on that and we do keep making changes. Now, one of the things I'm really happy about is our customers are keeping much more up to date with the software and they're getting those changes and that's going to be very valuable to the physicians. So a lot of these improvements are coming through your collaboration and partnerships with clients. So could you speak a little bit about how do you partner with clients and then uh, something that is relevant uh, for our audience here, can you tell us a little bit more about Epic's relationship with us, with Cleveland Clinic? Sure. Well, we try to stay close with clients can't always do that, but we certainly try. And one of the things we've done is to stay close at multiple levels. And we've created the role of BFF. Now, when we first did BFF, people thought it was funny. We're, we're thinking it wasn't serious, but really like that concept of a best friend forever. Some people didn't know what it meant, but clearly if you have teenage daughters, you know what it means. And so, the BFF's role is to do exactly what that name says. Try to figure out what is your customer doing that is great, that is really something that's worth everybody else knowing, and how do you let the rest of the world know what your customer is doing? On the flip side, what are others doing that your customer can learn from and improve? And so it's the back and forth both ways. I've seen uh, at some of the meetings, our cus customers put their arms around their BFF and proudly say, this is my BFF. And I think that's wonderful that they feel that way. I don't think they'd say, this is my account manager. So <laughs> it creates a new relationship. Uh, I've heard someone say, my BFF is better than your BFF. <laughs> and the response was, well, if we both feel that way, then we're good. So it is a really good role. Uh, what else? We, uh, we try to, uh, with groups like Cleveland Clinic, and there aren't very many groups just like Cleveland Clinic, um, there, there's a few things that make you um, different. You have a lot of innovation, such as with what you mentioned, COVID for Care Companion. You needed to free up beds. You needed to be able to send home patients with COVID who were not as sick as the serious patients who needed those beds. And so we created with you the ability for the patient to go home, for the software to educate the patient about COVID, to remind the patient of what to do. So the patient kept on the regimen and to alert Cleveland Clinic if things were going downhill, so you could jump in and grab that patient and bring the patient back to the hospital. And 50 other healthcare organizations have used it besides you folks. Uh, the other thing that I think that's very interesting about Cleveland Clinic is you have your international side. And as you know, of course, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. And that's just a fun place to be at. It's a beautiful place. And what you're building right now, Cleveland Clinic London. And so that too, working with you on those is just a whole bigger view of what healthcare is and what you folks are. And uh, we cannot thank you enough because uh, Epic was an essential tool for us as a international organization to provide the uniform and seamless experience and a quality of care uh, among all of, our, all of our sites. So when we see our caregivers, uh, let's say, uh, traveling from uh, Cleveland to Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio to Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, when they walk into Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, they feel at home and to a large yeah. extent it is because they're using Epic. So, yeah. yeah. And do you have two large group of groups of customers? Uh, one group of customers are hospital systems and providers, physicians, nurses, uh, uh, clinical staff. The other large group and growing group of customers are patients. Yes. So. 
how do you get patients involved in managing their own healthcare records? Well, we have, I think it's 165 million patients who have a current uh, record in uh, my chart or have a current, I shouldn't say a record in my chart, who have my chart. That makes us basically the eighth biggest country in the world, if you counted the my chart patients as a country. So how do you get patients involved in managing their own? I think there's a couple things there. First of all, the knowledgeable patient usually is a healthier patient. So that's a good thing. Secondly, we have found that patients don't want to manage their own information. They want you folks to manage it. They want to be able to trust you, to know you're keeping the records well. And although there have been attempts at having patients manage their own records, in general, after a while, it might start off good, but after a while, it isn't kept up. Information is forgotten to be entered. Uh, the medication isn't put in right, et cetera, et cetera. So our experience has been that about half a percent of the patients want to manage their own, have been even interested in managing their own record, and then that falls off. So 99 and a half percent haven't even taken that step to be interested in managing it. Again, they want the health systems to manage it. They want the health systems to exchange it. So all that data is there. Do you agree yeah. with that? Oh, I agree with that. I agree with it. I think managing the uh, the patient records is a complex and it's very responsible task. And uh, I think it's an essential in providing a continuity, continuity of care. And most of our patients, based on our experience as well, trust us providers to provide an, the information and manage their records appropriately. And uh, uh, this is in particular important now when we strive to provide this continuum of care, not just an episode of care, but really we're trying to keep people healthy. And the uh, COVID pandemic has really highlighted that need. So I would, I wanted to, uh, to speak uh, with you a little bit about your response to, to COVID pandemic, given the fact that uh, uh, so many millions of patients are uh, using your records and providers, obviously. How did you respond to this, uh, to this new challenge in healthcare? In many ways, so I have a piece of paper here to help me because there's so many ways. Um, we got a call from one of the states that said, we need you to put your software into several thousand beds and we need it done in five days. And we thought, Five days, it takes months, you can't do it in five days. And then of course we thought, well, it's COVID time and we have to figure it out, which we did. And the trick of course was to get a, an existing customer to quickly extend their software into those beds. And I've often thought what a huge help that is. If you don't know who the patient is and all you know is here comes a body on a gurney what in the world do you do compared to you have information about who the patient is, the allergies, the chronic diseases, et cetera. So one of the things we did was we installed over 90,000 beds, including places as like Javits and Hope in Boston. And uh, oh, my favorite was the, the ship, The Comfort, uh, McCormick Place in Chicago. And a lot of our customers extended out into nearby hotels, into um, uh, high school areas and things like that where they could put patients. So that was one thing. Um, we made a lot of new software available fast. For example, our infection control Bugsy and about nine other um, modules of software. We just said to folks, use them. There's no charge for them during the COVID period. We'll do all the installs for free. There's no maintenance. So all of that was during COVID and a lot of our customers uh, installed whatever they needed to help them take care of COVID patients. Um, we did the home monitoring. As you, as you know, we did drive-through testing in thousands of locations so that 
patients could drive, drive through and get tested and the results could come back to them. We developed a lot of new features in the software so that uh, the software was better able to deal with COVID and we released that. Um, we, what else? Uh, we created, this was really interesting. We had feedback from some of our health systems that they were seeing too many deaths on ventilators. And we decided to study that. And so we did a study of that and then we just said, where do you publish it? Well, if you went to some of the most commonly highly respected journals, even in rush mode, it would take uh, weeks and months. And so we said, okay, let's create our own journal. So we created ehrn.org and we're able to publish things immediately. And what we say is it's better to have good data available quickly than perfect data available too late. And for COVID, it would be too late if it took months. So ehrn.org is up and running and has been quoted in many, many other places uh, with many, many different articles in there. Um, we uh, did telehealth. We put telehealth into 200 health systems and uh, facilitated the training for 5,000 people. We did a lot of support in Wisconsin. The governor called up and said that uh, we are known for having good project managers. Can we spare uh, a dozen or two for the state of Wisconsin to manage child care, uh, testing, and all sorts of things? So we said yes and donated our folks. And then we gave one of our buildings to healthcare organizations so they could have child care in there so that their healthcare providers could go to work knowing their kids had a place. And then we gave them food. And when the parents picked breakfast, lunch, and dinner, when the parents picked up the kids, we had uh, bread for them to take home. So that's just some of the things we were doing. We have not charged anything for anything COVID related. So my chart increases, we haven't charged for telehealth use, haven't charged for, we're saying you shouldn't make money off of COVID. Well, thank you very much for, for, for what you do. I'm sure that it was so much appreciated by everyone in your extended community. And now as we're kind of closing up, I want to ask you now, we spoke, uh, you spoke now about what COVID has uh, brought out in your organization, you know, the, the rapidity, the quickness, uh, the uh, ability to do a lot of uh, innovative work in a short period of time. Uh, could you uh, speak a little bit about the epic products or initiatives that you are currently most excited about and you're planning to, to bring forward? I'd say there's three of them. The first is ehrn.org. And that's really exciting. It's a whole new area, which is take the learnings we have and get them out to people right away. And our health systems can also send us their learnings so that if they want something published right away, we can get it out for them very quickly. So that's number one, I think it's very exciting. Number two is Cosmos. Cosmos is the database that we have that we're pulling in electronic health information from our customers with their uh, agreement. And we expected to have 50 million records in there by the end of 2020. But we're not at the end, and we already have 60 million in there with more coming every day. What we can do with Cosmos, I think, is exciting. And someone said that this will be the biggest change in healthcare since penicillin. I don't know if that's true or not, that's quite a claim, but we have heard multiple times that there's only about 10% evidence-based medicine. So people are coming to decisions for their patients based on anecdotal information or their best guess. And so what Cosmos is gonna be able to do, and we're writing the code for that now, is not only study Cosmos for EHRN. Uh, for example, we did a big study on uh, the decrease in cancer scans and screening uh, during COVID time, which is gonna have repercussions later on. But not only that, but to have the physician with the patient next to him or her be able to get from 
uh, Cosmos, we call it best care for your patient, what others similar to that patient have done and what works best. And then they'll be able to have evidence-based medicine for such a much greater percent of the patients that they are seeing. I think that's gonna be a real breakthrough. And the last is working with the payers and the providers together so that we can share the data. The payers and providers can get insights from mixing the claims data and the EHR data. And in addition, to make pre-auths be much easier and to have claims be much easier too and take away the overhead and the time for both of those. So those are my three favorite right now. Yeah. Well, look forward to experiencing each and every one of them. And there is one last question I wanted to ask you. I always wonder about it. Okay. And that is that you have such a creative names for your products. <laughs> you know, for example, infectious disease, Bugsy. Yep. You know, most other, most other software companies uh, come up with the names that are far less playful and uh, 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 less telling. How do, you, how do you come up with those names? Some of them just come to mind right away. So it's just boom, and the right name is there. Others take a long time. And some of them, our staff come up with 20 ideas and then we narrow them down and pick one. But it's life is short. It's a whole lot more fun to have fun with the names than <laughs> to have boring names. Uh, and if you come to Epic, you'll see our campus is that way too. It's a really fun campus with that same philosophy. If you're going to yeah. work here and spend your time here, make it fun. Yeah. Well. Thank you so much for sharing the story of you and your company with us, Judy. Uh, this particular, this last answer tells so much about the culture and the environment in which uh, you and uh, uh, all of our friends in Epic work each and every day. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was our pleasure. <laughs> and to all of you who are watching, thank you all for being part of this event. We have an exciting lineup of future guests in our Ideas for Tomorrow series. On September 16th, business and government leader Valerie Jarrett, the former senior advisor to President Barack Obama. On September 21st, Tim Brown, chair of the design firm IDEO. And on December 2nd, Melody Hobson, co-CEO and president of Aerial Investment and an authority on financial literacy. I hope you'll join us and thank you.